everyone. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the College Admissions Q&A panel hosted by Access Scholars and yours truly, Coach Tony from College Career Academy as well. We have an incredible event for you today. If you're here live, welcome, welcome to the event. You're in the right place. And today we have four amazing speakers with us as well. We're going to do a quick intros in like two minutes. But real quick for you guys to know kind of the structure of this event. This event should go about an hour, hour and a half. We'll see based on questions, based on the, the interactivity of the event. We're going to go ahead after me. We're going to do a quick intros for the amazing panelists we have today. And the rest of the time is Q&A. We have a few questions that we have pre-planned that you guys submitted to us. We got brought the, the, the common ones. We found 11 questions that you guys all had in common. We're going to start off with those. And then afterwards, right, I want to make sure whoever's here live, you guys get what you guys are looking for as well. So or any questions you guys have, go ahead and pop them in the chat throughout the entire event. Don't have to wait till the very end. If you have a question, pop it in the chat and I'll, I'll save it on my end and we'll ask it at the very end as well. At the end, we'll do a quick little wrap up. Okay, so, and also uh, feel free to, to enjoy, right? Sometimes when you guys are writing, you can't hear as you guys are writing. So right now, just enjoy, take everything in. The re we are recording this event and you will get access to the replays. You can rewatch it, take notes afterwards. But for this one, I want you guys to stay fully focused, right? And then uh, listen to all the amazing speakers that we have today. Lots of people are here live. So if you are here, say hi in the chat below. And let's go ahead. And kick it out. I have my amazing friend John from Access Scholarships. He's gonna do a quick little intro for our amazing speakers. Hi, hi everyone. This is uh, John Kara George. I'm with AccessScholarships.com. We are a scholarship, and more importantly, a college uh, application uh, resource. So everything from stemming scholarships to applications and essay. We offer advice. We also offer our own. Uh, free one-on-one -on -one scholarship search help. So for any students that are out there who are struggling with scholarships, we have office hours on Fridays and that's totally free. And we're happy to help you in your quest to, uh, to find scholarships uh, for school. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna start uh, from the top here. Um, we have Emily in the, in the top box, at least for me, Emily Ross from the University of Arizona. Emily, go ahead and say hi and tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tony. And thank you to everyone who is Zooming in this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, where I am, I am in Tucson, Arizona. I am representing the University of Arizona. My name is Emily Ross, and I'm the Executive Director for Recruitment and Enrollment Marketing at the U of A. Uh, really excited to be here tonight to chat with you all and to connect. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty biased when it comes to all things U of A and the Wildcats. I'm an alumnus myself uh, and have been at the U of A for over a decade uh, in the admissions office. So excited to connect with everyone tonight. Awesome. Uh, next up is Kristen Crosby with Ohio Wesleyan. Hi, Kristen. Hi there, I'm really excited to be here and I've got over 20 years of experience in admissions so I'm happy to answer lots of questions and share some knowledge. Um, but I've been with Ohio Wesleyan about three years now and love our community. I love our location. We're close to Columbus, which is the 14th largest city in the US and um, excited to be here tonight. Awesome. Next up is Rod Jackson with uh, SMU or Southern Med Methodist University. Rod, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me, Rod Jackson, again with SMU in sunny uh, Dallas, Texas, home of uh, America's team. We won't get into that right now. <laughs> uh, may make some enemies before we even start. Um, Really glad to be here. I've been at SMU for, I think this is my 20th year. So you can tell by the gray hairs, it's not just my children that have made me gray, it's my students as well. Uh, but really glad to be here, looking forward to um, chatting with the students and answering questions and hopefully offering some insight to this crazy college admissions process. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Rod. And next up is Katie Immel 
with Penn State University. Hi everyone, as you mentioned, my name is Katie. I am the Assistant Director for Recruitment at Penn State. I actually work out of our University Park campus, which is our largest one, the one that um, most people have heard of, although we do have 20 of them. But I'm happy to talk to you guys. I'm a little jealous of everyone in um, Texas and Arizona right now because it is quite cold where I am, especially here in my office. I'm even more cold. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys. And I'm going to go ahead and throw my email in, as I'm sure everyone else will, into the chat in case you have questions later on today as well. Awesome. Tony, we're going to kick it back to you. All right, all right. It's Q&A time. This is what you all came for tonight. And then we have four amazing individuals from four incredible schools here to answer all your questions. So again, take advantage of this opportunity. I didn't have this when I was in high school. I wish I did. So you guys have the amazing opportunity. You literally have people who can give you the exact answers you're looking for. So again, this event, right? You can learn a lot of stuff, but I want you guys to be selfish. Be selfish. What do you want to know specifically? And drop that in the chat, right? Leverage this time you got with these amazing experts. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and just go around and just, I think all these questions are pretty broad enough that each school might have a little, uh, the, little, little twist and spin to them as well too. So let's start off with the first question. Uh, the first question today is what are the most important admission factors for your school? So uh, we can do this one of two ways. If uh, you can kind of raise your hand, answer the question first, or we can have all four of you answer the questions. Uh, obviously, um, some of the questions probably apply to most of the schools, I think. So we try to make it pretty broad, but why don't we start off with the qu first question again with Emily. And uh, Emily, can you tell us a little bit more about what are the most important missions uh, factors for your school? Sure, happy to. So. The U of A, we are a large public land grant school. And so uh, we really do have our, our minds on access and want to um, have open doors of opportunity for students. And so when it comes to what we're looking for and the most important factors, definitely academics is gonna be up there. We wanna know how you've done um, it throughout your high school career. So freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, and then even the classes that you're taking into that senior year. So those are really going to be the key pieces. Uh, we are a part of a bigger system. The Arizona Board of Regents governs the schools in Arizona. So there are 16 core courses in particular we're looking for. I don't think they'll surprise any of you too much. They're your usual uh, subjects, if you will. So we've got you know four years of math, four years of English, that kind of thing. So that would be, I think, the most important is really the, the performance in those classes throughout your high school career. Uh, but we do have opportunities in our application to share more about involvement. There's a personal statement. So we, we really do use the application to get to know you as a whole human and not just look at those grades. Awesome. And we'll throw the question over to Kristen now. So Ohio Wesleyan is a small private university. We have about 1,500 students. So we really take our time getting to know each and every applicant, um, certainly through the application, but we try to get to know them even before they even apply. The most important factor, which is probably the same at just about every college or university is the academic um, profile of the student. But that doesn't mean that we're counting up things like honors and APs. Um, it doesn't mean that we're looking for students who just have the top notch grades. We're looking to see, um, are you on an upward trend? Have you challenged yourself? And above all, do you have that intellectual curiosity and that drive? Because the academics at Ohio Wesleyan are small classes, discussion-based classes, really hands-on learning where you're working in group projects, you might be doing research internship. So we want to find students who look for that kind of environment, that curiosity, who are going to be comfortable taking themselves out of their comfort zone. And we also are looking um, at all the other pieces in terms of a match for Ohio Wesleyan. Again, it's not about counting up leadership and community service and artistic and athletic talents. It's just getting 
a sense of who you are, what's important to you, what you love to do. And as we read the application, both the um, activities, the essay, what you have to say about yourself, as well as what your teachers and counselor have to say about you, we really are trying to imagine you as a student, as a learner, and as a community member on our campus. Awesome, thank you very much. Rod, over to you. Um, we are, we're considered small to mid-size. Um, and we have what we call, uh, we use a CBE evaluation process or so committee-based evaluation, uh, which gives us a little more um, of an opportunity to look at every little bit of the application. So the essay, that extracurricular involvement, the, um, of course, the grades, testing if a student submits testing, uh, the curriculum, we get to get a, a contextual look at each student. Um, so we get about 15,000 apps and we read them, read them all here in our office. So um, I would say as far as most important, it's always an academic review. Students need to be academically solid, regardless of how great an essay you write or how many ac ac uh, activities you're involved in. Uh, you really need to be solid on the academic side to be competitive in the process. All right, sorry about that. I had to unmute myself there. Katie, over to you. Just gonna jump in, <laughs> it's all good. Um, <laughs> so much like the other universities, we are an academic university. It's going to come down to your academics. Um, by far, that's the majority of our decision. Um, the really great part about Penn State is that we do have 20 campuses. So if for some reason, you know, your grades are not as good as you would like them to be, um, we do have access to education as one of our strategic goals. So if you're not admissible to your first choice campus, we do review you for your alternative choice campus. And usually we can find a spot for you. A lot of students do thrive in the big university feel with the large class sizes, but a lot of students do need that personal connection. So by having our smaller campuses that are about 500 to 5,000 students, those students might need that one on one attention talking with the professor more often, um, you know, making sure that you get to class and having your professor actually notice. So um, as far as admissions factors, if you don't have the grades necessarily for our University Park campus, which happens to be our most competitive, chances are you do have a chance at Penn State and you still get a great education, you still get that diploma, you just might start at one of our smaller campuses um, because that really is the majority of our decision. As far as leadership activities, of course, we want really involved students, we want that leadership, but those factors are very small in our review process. Obviously, some of the other schools have a smaller applicant pool, which is great because they are a little bit more holistic than what we can do for our university. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Now, I think you guys all have mentioned, you know, the application process and, and essays. So maybe um, uh, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of weight you put on essays or uh, what kind of stories um, you want the students to come out in their essays, I guess. Um, and we can kind of talk about extracurriculars, but it's, I'll open it up to the, to the four that are on here. Does anyone want to talk about their essay process and maybe what goes into uh, a great essay or some of the better essays that you've read? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll dive in. Let's see where okay, great. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Thanks, Rod. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, I don't know. I'm. I'm. Look, you shouldn't give me the mic in the stage because I'll talk forever. But I'm. I'm one of those people that when I go to a restaurant and I go out to eat, you know, everyone loves the main course, but I'll open up the menu and look at the desserts first because I'm always like, okay, well, what can I get when I finish eating my meal? I kind of look at the 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 essay as kind of the dessert of the the. Um, personally kind of look at it as, as the dessert of the application because the transcript tells us how great the student has been in the classroom the rec letters tell us how um, great the student has been outside of the classroom the resume tells us about all the act activities the essay is a chance for the student to tell us uh, about themselves what's important to them what are they adamant about what has been influential in their lives 
And it really gives us an idea of what the student thinks and their thought process and uh, how they feel about themselves or, or, or different experiences that they've been through that have had a profound effect on their lives. The more we know about a, a student, the better we can serve as an advocate for the student. Um, oftentimes students are afraid to brag. They feel like they're bragging about themselves or you know, they're saying too much, but we want to know about you. That's why we ask for an, an essay. Um, so the more you can give us with that essay, the better it can help, help us as we're reviewing your file to get to know you and to put your file, everything that's in your file into context regarding uh, you and your personal life. I'll jump in if you don't mind. Um, I think that there is so much pressure that students feel about writing an essay that will make them stand out or will make them sound unique. And I just wanna say, don't um, feel like you have to stand out and be unique because if you focus on finding your true voice, writing about something that is truly meaningful to you, um, if you kind of narrow it down, boil it down to one really specific topic um, and focus on lots of the details and help me feel like I'm in that moment or in that situation with you, those are all really great ways to um, engage the reader and stand out. And, you know, you could just be writing about something as mundane as um, you go for a run every single day. Uh, and maybe you describe what's in your playlist, what you see every day as you run, um, how you're feeling when you warm up. And then as you continue on through your run, um, if I were to say to somebody, why don't you write about running? That wouldn't sound like a very exciting essay topic, but it's how you handle it. If it's something that is really part of who you are in your daily routine um, and it means something to you, then you're going to um, do probably a great job writing that essay as opposed to kind of writing what you think admission want, officers want to hear or trying to come up with something that's, um, I don't want to say gimmicky, but you know, uh, that you're intentionally trying to catch the reader's attention. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, so next question, and I, I can speak a little bit to this because my daughter is a year removed. Uh, she's a freshman this year in college. So we went through this last year with her with uh, test optional um, versus uh, non-test optional, obviously. But what advice can you give students and how they can navigate test optional admissions? And maybe we can start off, um, have each of you talk a little bit about whether your schools are, are test optional um, and how they can navigate that. We'll start with Emily. She looks like she's ready. I'm ready, John. All right. Uh, so definitely, I you know, the, the pandemic brought a lot of changes around test scores across the country at different institutions. At the University of Arizona, SAT and ACT test scores have always been optional for admission. Uh, but they have been required for our scholarship consideration or for our honors college in the past. We did make changes uh, to that for the last couple of cycles now. And so students do not need an SAT or ACT test score to be considered for any of those things. So admission to the U of A, admission to honors or consideration for our scholarships. Um, and so that's something that we have in place we do review our scholarship policies every year in the spring. Uh, and so that's something just to know about, I think lots of schools that those policies do change year over year. And so it's important to know that what you're looking at right now, maybe as a junior or a sophomore could look differently for you as a senior in high school and that kind of thing. So that's something just to know in general. Um, but I would say, that would be my advice is continuing to stay connected with groups like this evening, um, with your different resources within your community, within your school, and start to really create uh, a sense of the schools that you have an interest in or are intrigued by and, and do some research on what are their testing policies so that you can be sure uh, you're, you're not missing something uh, should you want to have that door of opportunity. Awesome. I'll throw it over to Kristen. Yeah, 
uh, Ohio Wesleyan has been test optional for I think at least nine, maybe 10 years. Um, one piece of advice that I would give is to not just look at the average SAT score at a college, uh, but maybe look at the middle 50%. Uh, because that provides a really wide range of test scores that the college or university has accepted. So for instance, Ohio Wesleyan's middle 50% range is from 1050 to 1320. Um, so that means we also accept students with higher than that, even a little bit lower than that. But if you fall within that really wide range, then you know you're in the ballpark. Um, if you've taken test scores and you're thinking, should I submit them? But I would just say that there's so many other ways that you can spend your time. Don't worry too much about studying for that SAT. We'd rather see that you study for classes or pursue all those fun activities that you do or work your after school job. Awesome. Uh, Rod? Um, we are for the past two years, uh, last year and again this year, we are a temporary, temporary test optional institution. So test scores are not required last year and this year. We are very excited about it and uh, saw probably our most, one of our most academically competitive and one of our most diverse classes this, this uh, past year. Um, so we think we'll have that same thing this year and, and if it were our decision in admissions, we would go test optional completely. We've always been test optional with our performing and visual arts programs, but uh, going uh, university wide, I think it's been a huge plus for us. And um, we're test optional regardless of um, uh, admissions or scholarships. So whether you submit a test score or not, you're still completely uh, considered for all of our, uh, for admission and our academic scholarships. Uh, and I want to say last year, about 47%, 48, 47, 48% of our admitted students came in through the test optional process. Uh, so we are truly test optional. Okay, great. Katie? Uh, much like SMU, we uh, have been test optional for two years. We are test optional through 2023. So this year and next year, we have made that decision, but we have not decided further. As Emily mentioned, we will review that. Um, as Rod mentioned, we are hoping it stays test optional because it does open the door for um, just a lot more students that maybe wouldn't have applied because their score was low or they thought that, you know, they didn't do so hot, whatever it is. Um, but I always tell students that test optional is exactly what it is, right? So if you were able to take the test and you think you did well and it's an accurate description of who you are as a student, go ahead and include your score. We're going to review it. If you didn't do so hot, or you're not a great test taker, um, or you weren't even able to take it, you know, the pandemic really did hurt a lot of that, then go ahead and go test optional. At least at Penn State, the bulk of our decision really is still that academic, you know, the classes you took, the grades you received, the rigor of those courses. So whether you had, unless you had like a 1600 SAT, that decision doesn't normally change based on the SAT. We know it's one test. You could have had a bad day. You could have had a really good day. Um, so I always tell students, like, if you're really proud of that score or you think it's like, this is exactly the score I expected to get, go ahead and include it. But if you just are not a great standardized test taker, go ahead and go test optional. I think that's really the, like, if you could find a bright side in the pandemic was that a lot more schools went test optional and you could really see a student for who they are, you know, do they study, do they get good grades, because you might get a really great SAT and you might not. Um, so I think that's kind of where we're directed. I'm hoping they stay with that, kind of like Rod said, if it was in admissions hands, we definitely would. But I think just do what you feel is right. And I think Kristen even said, don't spend as much time studying for the SAT. Study for your classes, do those extracurriculars, enjoy your senior year. That's really what we want to see more than likely. All right, great. Thanks. All great responses, by the way. Um, Real quick, ahead, I, I, I'm going to take my own advice. I'm going to be a little selfish right now uh, and ask a, a quick follow up for, to this question. So for me, like I majority help law students in the California area and we went test blind, so we don't even look at it anymore. Uh, but I do work with some students who are test optional as well, too. So um, the consensus is submit it if you can. If not, it's OK. And that's the general advice I've been giving. But then what would you say would submitting a low score 
her a student or would you recommend just don't submit it? Like what's in that group? Because I have, I, have, I have a group of students I'm working with and they, they, they're doing, doing their best and then it's not the greatest score. So it, it should I lean towards, yes, to submit it anyway, it's not going to hurt or let's not submit it. What, what's like the general consensus when it comes to that type of range of students? Sorry, Emily, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that on mute too. I was like, oh. Um, so at the U of A, it, it won't hurt you to send that score. Uh, so, uh, uh, but that will vary by school to school. So I'm intrigued to hear the rest of the panel. Um, I would say it really depends on the rest of their profile, right? So if they're a pretty good student and they have a really low score, it probably won't affect it. But if they are already kind of baseline and then they also submit that low score, that would be something that we would not necessarily hurt them, but they might not get their first choice campus because at University Park, there are standardized, like not standardized tests, but there's Scantron, you know, multiple choice. So there's a type of student that does better in that environment. And there's a type of student that does better in a small school, like a smaller um, campus. So I think that would be what affected them, not necessarily the score being low, but the fact that like they might not do as well on standardized tests. So I would probably encourage them not to submit it um, if they think it's like lower than what they can do as a student. I'm gonna say on one hand, Students often think that, oh, their score is pretty low if, you know, if they think they have a low score, when in reality, it might not actually be that low. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also going to say that if a school is truly test optional, um, it's just one less piece of information that we have to review your application. So, you know, if you have that doubt, um, and if you don't have the time to check the middle 50% or anything like that, then maybe just apply test optional because we can definitely review your application and find all kinds of other great ways to make that connection and that match um, if we don't have a test score. And I, I, and I wanna say ditto to what Kristen just said. <laughs> all right, great. So our next question, uh, does your school allow students the opportunity to interview? And if so, does the interview impact chances of admission? So why don't we, instead of opening it up to all uh, or asking all four, um, I know some schools offer an interview, some schools don't. So if our panelists can kind of chime in, if they do offer an interview and a little bit more about that process, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, currently, well, we do not. We do not offer an interview as part of the admissions process. Um, we welcome individual meetings. We have one-to-one -one -one meetings with families on a regular basis if they have questions about the process, but it's not an interview. Uh, so that's something we do not utilize during the admissions process. And I would say Ohio Wesleyan is pretty similar. We don't really want to call them interviews because that sounds intimidating and scary. Um, so instead, you know, we contact students and say, hey, come have coffee with Kristen, um, tea with Tanique. And it's really meant to be a conversation so that we can get to know you, but that you can also ask questions, find out if we're a good match for you. You know, if we have financial aid and scholarships and programs that you are looking for. And the other thing is that we um, welcome a family member to come with you to the meeting. So usually an interview is just one-on-one -on -one with the student, um, but these conversations allow the whole family to be involved and just talk about uh, the college search process and things like that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, Emily, if you wanted to chime in or don't interview. Don't okay. <laughs> is enough. My last question before I hand over to Tony is, um, you know, we kind of get this question a lot. Uh, actually, I have a different question that was on here, but I'll go with number five that's on here anyway. Tony, can you bring that back up? 
So does a student's chance of admission change if they indicate undecided versus a specific major or program at your school? And I'm gonna mix it up since I've been starting with the top with Emily. I'm gonna start with Katie here. Um, so yes, um, but it really we, we review based on our academic colleges. So we do have 12 of them. For instance, if you're applying to business, that's going to be a different review than if you're applying to engineering versus undecided. So um, some of our like more competitive programs like business, like nursing, undecided is going to usually be a little bit um, less competitive, but compared to other colleges, it could become more competitive. But to be honest, it changes every single year with our applicant pool and it changes every single year depending on um, what that college needs, you know, how many seats they have. So we do do it by academic college. So yes, applying undecided could change things, but I would encourage like, if you really are debating between two majors that are not very similar, or if you just have no idea what you want to study, which is perfectly fine at 16, 17, 18 years old, like that's normal, um, then come in undecided. We have a great program that you're able to work with academic advisors and really start to narrow down what you want to study, what you're passionate about to be able to find yourself at Penn State or any of these fine institutions. Um, so I think the big part is like only apply undecided if you really don't know or you're deciding between a few. If you know that you definitely want to be a mechanical engineer major, you know, that's where you should apply because you're going to have the right advising from the beginning. If that's what you don't think that just because you come in undecided, it's going to be easier. That's not really what we would tell you to do. We'd tell you to do what you're passionate about. If you just have no idea, that's okay to come in undecided. Let me unmute here. Uh, Kristen? Yeah, so I think it definitely depends on the college or university that you're looking at. Um, for Ohio Wesleyan, we are a small liberal arts and sciences type college university. So for us, we truly don't um, factor in your intended major into the application process. Um, it's a, just a piece of information that we have about you, kind of lets us know your interests. The only reason why you might want to put it down um, is because at Ohio Wesleyan and maybe a good number of other colleges, there might be additional scholarships that you qualify for. So a finer performing arts scholarship, an economics and business scholarship. So um, usually when students put undecided, it doesn't mean that they don't have interests. It me usually means they have multiple interests. And the good thing about the common application and most other applications is that there's room to put more than one academic interest or major. Um, and that way you can um, maybe qualify for more than one of those scholarship competitions. And to answer Yamin's question, um, you're not locked into that major oftentimes. I mean, maybe if you're applying to a specific college, like at Penn State, you're calling, applying to, you know, College of Engineering, you're locked into that. But if you're applying to a school that doesn't require you to declare a major in your common application, um, you, you're not locked into that major just because you've put it in the common application. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm having a problem with my mute and unmute. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Emily, how about you? So we do not look at um, major necessarily with our admission process. And so if you come in, uh, we call it undeclared. Uh, so that's, uh, I know I want to get a college degree, but I don't know in exactly what just yet. Uh, and you'll have a whole support team to help you figure out what it is you do want to ultimately study. We do have some degrees and majors that have selective admissions. So those are things like engineering, uh, our College of Architecture, uh, Fine Arts, that kind of thing. They'll have some more uh, selective criteria, but if you don't know what you wanna do, that won't impact you at all in terms of admission or scholarship opportunities. Um, to Yamin's questions too, uh, absolutely you can change your major later and many students do. I know I myself changed my major several times uh, as a wildcat. So 
uh, it's it's normal in many ways to change your mind along the way because you'll meet great faculty wherever you go uh, who will really inspire you and um, make you think, hmm, maybe I want to do that. Maybe that's the direction I want to go. So just wanted to share that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tony, I'm going to kick it off to you for the next set of questions. All righty. Cool, cool. We're at the halfway mark. Lots of amazing questions, by the way. Our, our Q&A thing is blowing up. You guys are doing amazing so far. Feel free to keep asking questions throughout the event. Our amazing panelists are really great multitaskers of answering and typing at the same time as well. So super, super awesome session so far. All right, next one for you guys. Um, how, any tips on how to narrow down the school? So a lot of our students here today are from all over freshmen, sophomore, juniors, uh, even some seniors as well too. So they have a big list of schools that they kind of want to go to, but what do you, from your opinion, working with lots of students, how should they narrow that down? Let's do free for all, whoever gets it first. Well, I'm gonna jump in and say, don't just go by rankings or schools that you've heard of or colleges where you know people have gone before, you definitely want to figure out which is going to be a good fit for you. And first of all, if you have a guidance counselor at your school, that is going to be a good resource and that person uh, might be able to help you make a, a really broad list. And then as you have that broad list, do some research, narrow it down, see which feels like a good fit in terms of the personality of the university. Do they have the programs that you're interested in? And then if you have an opportunity to um, get to know a college or university through a virtual session, through a chat with a current student or professor, um, if you play a sport and you wanna meet with a coach, you can really get to know a school's personality um, through those contacts with representatives of the school. Um, and I'll let some colleagues chime in as well. Well, it seems like every time we talk, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Katie. Um, I was just gonna say um, the pandemic, I told, all of my students this, it's literally the best thing that could have happened, weirdly enough, is because all schools all of a sudden had all these virtual programs, virtual tours, virtual information sessions, the ability to, you know, chat with a current student. So yes, some schools were obviously doing that before, but I know that we really stepped up our game. So I think you're able to really explore a lot right now. And I think that's amazing because a school that maybe is 10 states away that you really like, but you wouldn't have your parents do, you know, a road trip there or something, you're able to kind of get a feel for it. But what I told students even before the pandemic is find a smaller school, find a big school and find a medium sized school in your area, like locally, because you're going to be able to visit them and say, wow, I loved the idea of a really small school. I loved the idea that I got to know everyone. People are waving on campus. If that's what you like, great. You might like a really big school that you get to do the D1 sports, that type of thing. So you're able to kind of explore without traveling too far to start to realize, I actually really like a big school. I actually really like a medium-sized school. And then from there, find the ones that offer your program if you have a very small niche program. And like everyone was saying, just talk to a current student. That's really where you're going to get like the best advice. Like that's where you're going to figure out if this is my type of school or not. And, you know, as admissions counselors, we're accessible. We want to help you answer all those questions. We want to connect you. Um, so I think just finding out, do you want to stay in state, out of state, small school, big school, and then um, going from there. But you can do a lot of digging right in your own neck of the woods and then go broader. I'm going to wait awkwardly for three seconds. All right. Awesome, awesome, right? Next one uh, for us is like, so a lot of students are taking a very rigorous schedule and taking rigorous courses. So for any of you guys who can feel free to jump in this one, how important would you guys say are AP tests, IB tests, and the SAT subject tests? So this is the, the tests outside of the ACT and SAT. I would say considering that some of us have, have um, I think many of us, I don't know, I can't remember, 
have gone test optional, have, some have been test optional, uh, subject tests aren't, aren't really a big part of the process. Even before we went um, test optional, subject tests were not a big part of the process or really wasn't used at all uh, in our admissions process. Um, as far as AP exams, IB, uh, since many of us are, are, are doing what we consider a, an academic review, it definitely helps uh, when students can show that they have pushed themselves academically. Um, but I would also say appropriately as well. Uh, if you're a student that um, loves English, uh, but doesn't really like math, then please don't get into Calculus BC just to be able to say, I took Calculus BC. Because the question always comes up, well, does it better if I have a B in a uh, AP class or an A in a, well, a, a B is a B and a C is a C and a D is a D. <laughs> so uh, we definitely enjoy uh, seeing students push themselves, whether it's college prep, whether it's dual credit, whether it's AP, whether it's IB. Um, but, but we also want students to do it, uh, to think thoroughly through that process and not just take a bunch of them um, to try to build their resume. I'm gonna be selfish at one more time. This question is not on the board. Uh, how do you guys feel about dual enrollment classes? That's the one thing like I have a soft spot for. I went to a school that had that. I opened my own high school that has that as well too. So what do you guys feel about dual enrollment comparison to, uh, compared to like AP courses? I would, sorry, I jumping in here. It looked like Katie was gonna say something. Um, again, it shows that you're challenging yourself, but the thing that I like about dual enrollment courses is that, um, you know, you're, you're taking something at an advanced level, but you're not necessarily preparing for a test or exam at the end of the year. So a lot of the AP curriculum, the IB um, curriculum are kind of preparing you for those exams at the end of the year, whereas I feel like dual enrollment classes would give you a taste of college level work, college level learning, and just allow you to enjoy um, pursuing that subject without that pressure of having to, uh, you know, prepare for that test. Yeah, as um, everyone's kind of mentioned, you know, an A is an A, a B is a B, obviously AP dual enrollment are all weighted differently. But I think as far as like, if you're going to take one that's going to help you later on, help you do better in college when, you know, like it's, it's great that it helps you get in, that it's a better, you know, a more weighted class and all of that. But really, if you're going to try to prepare yourself for college, taking a dual enrollment course is going to, obviously it's a dual enrollment. It is a college level course. Um, so I think that really helps students. And I always tell students like, if you're going to debate between the two, if you can do dual enrollment and those credits are going to transfer to whatever, um, college you're looking at, I would definitely do it because it's just such a great experience to start to get a taste of it before you would be thrown into five or six classes. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Very cool. Awesome. Next question is a fun one uh, as well, because I know the answer from a UC point of view. So I was, my, my background used was a, a UC Berkeley admissions reader. So that's how, so I know this side, but the question for you guys, which is, I think, really fun for the students. Can you walk through, so a student submits their applications to your school, what's that process look like from their submission all the way to the acceptance letter? What's on each of your school? What was like, show us the secrets. What's behind the scenes uh, that goes the whole route there? I can start. Um, and so at the U of A, we actually utilize self-reported grades. And so students will tell us the grades that they've taken in high school. Um, and that allows us to get a speedier decision back to you all um, so that you can get that information as soon as possible. We will ultimately verify it. So uh, we'll need that high school transcript, you know, before you enroll and start on campus. So there's some behind the scenes magic that happens uh, over the summer as well. But once a student submits their application, uh, it will go over to our admissions processing team. Uh, so we have an entire team dedicated to the review of our applications. 
Um, and that's because we are such a big school. And so we have a lot of applications come in and uh, we have a team that's solely dedicated to that. Um, at least a couple of folks will look over that application material. They'll look at the grades you've taken um, or the courses you've taken, the grades that you've received in those courses, review information that you've shared in terms of your involvement, the personal statement, that kind of thing. Um, depending on what our evaluation team sees, they might have a colleague or two look it over if they have any questions or want to verify anything on their end. Um, and then ultimately a decision is made. So typically students get a decision back from us within about two weeks. Uh, they'll get it both electronically in their future Wildcat portal, uh, but they'll also get it in the mail. So not nothing too secret. I wish there was like a cool, I don't know, magic wand moment, uh, but that's, that's how it works. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in because um, Penn State's is a lot like um, University of Arizona because we're a large institution. I would say the only difference because of our 20 campuses is once we do your first review for University Park is usually the first choice. If you're not admissible, uh, we will review you a second time then for another campus. So that's the only real big difference. But yeah, there's there's no hidden. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish we could talk about that. But uh it's really not. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and we we actually hold most of our decisions uh, for early action. So mo the majority of our decisions do not actually come out until the month of December for our early action students. So that is a little different as well. Um, we are not as quick unless you're applying to one of our smaller campuses. And then it's usually about a two, three week turnaround. All right. I think I have like a little hidden um, item that I can throw out there. So I would say probably most or many colleges and universities will notify you when your application has been submitted. Oftentimes students just kind of see that and they don't open it. Um, you want to open that email because it usually contains a login, um, a pin and your login information where you can go and check the status of your application to see what's missing. Um, another kind of secret hint is don't check that like minutes after you've submitted your application because sometimes the materials that um, may look like they haven't been received um, are kind of waiting in a holding place and will get added 24 hours later. So oftentimes students will email me and they'll say, oh, it looks like this teacher recommendation hasn't been submitted, but I know it's been submitted. So, you know, give it a 24 hours. Um, and the great thing is that you're in control when you can log in on a regular basis, see what's missing, contact the college and figure out how you can get it submitted. And oftentimes you'll be able to go in and see your decision, your financial aid award might be posted there, um, and then all kinds of other opportunities, uh, at least in our portal, um, you'll find out if you can apply for certain additional scholarships, if there are visit programs um, and things like that. And I'll dive in behind Krista. It seems like every time she talks, I can just say ditto. <laughs> Pretty similar. We, um, uh, oh crap, I forgot. Um, we submit, we receive all of our applications uh, and we don't, we send all of our decisions out at one time. Um, so we don't, for our early action, our early decision deadline, we send those decisions out. Uh, typically in mid-December and then regular decision ED2, we send those decisions out uh, late February, early March. Um, so we kind of do it, gather them all at once, review them together uh, and then send decisions out together. Awesome, awesome. I'll, I'll throw in a little, little sneak bonus as well too. So though you guys are interested in the UCs like LA, UC Berkeley, very similar. I think every school kind of pretty much does the same. Uh, but for UCs, they have external readers read. And there's like two, 300 of them per school that read them first. Then they make a recommendation. Then that goes to the admissions committee. Uh, and you guys find out in March. UCs will make you wait all the way to the end uh, to find out as well. Awesome, awesome. All right, next one's a fun one. Next one is about money, right? We, we love money. Access Scholarships is here. Uh, they're amazing. Our go-to resource for scholarships. So for you all uh, at your specific schools, how do applicants get selected for scholarships? Uh, well, I'll jump in. Going back to this reading process, when I'm reading an application, um, I am paying attention if there are certain um, uh, academic interests 
or extracurricular activities that make you qualified for certain scholarships. So I'll, I'll click those boxes off and then you'll um, receive an uh, invite to apply for those scholarships. Um, we also have a range of scholarships that will be kind of automatically applied based on GPA. Um, sometimes you can find that information easily on college websites. Other times it might be more mysterious. And you'll also be able to find on college websites if um, everyone is automatically considered for merit scholarship. If a college doesn't offer merit scholarships, maybe they only offer need-based aid. Um, so you want to have those financial conversations with your parents even before you start the whole application process because every college and university is going to have uh, a different policy when it comes to how they award, who gets awarded, if they're stackable, uh, and things like that. Okay, I will follow Christian again. Um, once students apply, they are automatically, once they apply, they're automatically considered for, for all of our scholarships. Um, there's only one that we have where students must submit an additional uh, application and essay and video. Um, and uh, earlier we talked about applying directly to schools. If um, a student missed what school they're interested in, so if they don't apply undecided and they list uh, something in the humanities and sciences or business or engineering or communications. Uh, each of our undergraduate schools has scholarship money to give to students as well. Um, but they make those decisions separate from our admissions office. Um, so I say that to let students know there is a possibility of students receiving more than one scholarship as an incoming student, depending upon how well they've done overall academically and the area they would like to major in. Um, so those are typically how we how we review uh, our application process for our scholarship process. Um, at Penn State, we are a free application for federal student aid school, so a FAFSA school. Um, assuming you submit the FAFSA, you will be reviewed for all of our university-wide scholarships. Um, the weird part, I guess, because we get a lot of feedback about this is even our merit-based scholarships that are university-wide, you have to have a FAFSA on file. So need-based scholarships are awarded based on obviously the need of a student. Um, and then our merit-based do go by mostly your GPA, you know, the, your classes you took, the rigor of those courses, that's gonna be the majority of our merit-based, but you still need that FAFSA on file. So I always tell students, even if you think your parents make too much money, you're not going to get any financial aid, we still need one on file at least for Penn State. Um, the other thing is our academic colleges, as I've mentioned a few times, they actually do have additional scholarship money. So once a student is admitted to, let's say, the College of Engineering, there are additional applications sometimes. So I always tell students, definitely get in touch with us. We want to send you the right links. But for university-wide scholarships, we will review you as soon as you submit that FAFSA. So we try not to make it too much extra work, but um, yeah. We think that a scholarship is um, worthy of an extra application sometimes. So uh, you just have to look at their academic page and they'll be listed. And real similar uh, to, to Katie at Penn State, uh, one key difference at the University of Arizona is we don't require a FAFSA to be on file for scholarship consideration. Uh, definitely encourage it for all the reasons Katie just shared. Um, it's, it's an important resource and just, again, more doors of opportunity. Uh, but for our admission scholarships, students just need to apply um, and, and that's it, complete their application. So I'm actually going to put in the chat, we make it really obvious and clear and transparent to you all of like, here is the GPA, here is the scholarship. So we've got a handy grid on our website. Um, that I will drop in the chat so you can check it out and see really clear what you would be eligible for. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next one's another fun question as well, too. I like a lot of schools have a, a recommended thing of like demonstrate in interest in our school. But the question back to you all is how do students demonstrate that? How, how do you want students to demonstrate interest in uh, your schools and specifically also um, the fun little side thing is because of the interesting year we had in 2020, does that affect in any way as well? So how do you, how do students show interest, demonstrate interest in your specific colleges? Uh, let me dive in before Kristen this time. 
and then she can say ditto. And we're gonna get, Katie, we're gonna get you some gloves over there so we can warm you up. <laughs> um, so demonstrated interest, we, uh, we are a Slate institution. We use uh, CRM called Slate and it gives us, it's a wonderful tool for admissions. It gives us the opportunity to do quite a bit as far as um, loading information, as far as reading files, as far as queries, reviewing what students do. Uh, and it also gives us the opportunity to track, track students' interest. Um, so since it's something we have and that's something that Slate is good at, we, we will uh, track a student's interest and students, uh, we can track interest in a number of different ways from obvious things like visiting campus or coming to meet with us when we visit your school or coming to one of, I heard someone mention tea with Tony or uh, coffee with Kate, you know, coming to those different types of events. Um, also, sometimes we can track, you know, when students reach out to us over email or when they call us or when they request one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings with us. Um, we can also track uh, how much time students have spent on our website. Um, so it's quite a bit out there um, that Slate offers. Sometimes it's a, a little bit too much for us. So it's not a huge, huge factor. And I can't say that uh, there has been one file that I've read where we're looking at it. And we're like, oh, this student didn't show enough interest. They're out. Uh, it's a really small part of the process, but it, since we have it and it's available, uh, it's something that, that we can look at and uh, see how much interaction the student has with the institution. I would say as someone who just wrapped up travel season, um, if any of you are not currently seniors, if you're younger, next year if colleges and universities that you're interested in are coming to your high school to visit or if there's a college fair at your high school or in your community definitely attend those college visits those college fairs don't be afraid to ask questions uh, because talking with admission officers who come and visit your school or your area is going to help give you a sense of what is important to you in the college search if a place is uh, a good fit for you. So check and see if there are school visits happening at your school. And then I think a great way to show interest and also get a sense of a, if a place is right for you is if you have the resources and the time to visit some of the college campuses. Uh, we always love it when a student has visited our campus. So that demonstrates top interest there. We realize that not everybody is able to, to visit. So you're not going to be at a disadvantage if you can't visit. But if you can, um, I definitely recommend it. I can jump in. I, I didn't want to like cut off Emily if she was going to, but um, we ne don't necessarily track demonstrative interest. But I always tell students if two things are like, if they're basically identical and we only have one spot and we see this student has uh, talked with a, a counselor, they've attended a presentation, that type of thing, they've shown interest, they might get a spot over someone that didn't. But other than that, we really don't track that because as even Krista mentioned, like not everyone has the resources to come to campus that shouldn't hurt someone. Someone might just like know that Penn State is exactly who they want to go to and not have to attend anything. They just want to apply. And that doesn't make them, um, for us, seem any different. So we don't demonstrate interest, but um, I'm sure a lot of schools do. So I think it's great to be involved. Also, we as admissions counselors want to help. We want to talk to you. So like it can never hurt to at least introduce yourself, come to one of our programs, come to a high school visit. That really will set you apart to show that, you know, you took time to get to know us, but for us to get to know you as well. I just echo the comments of my colleagues on the panel. I think talk to us. We're real people. We want to talk to you. Uh, we want to help you through the process. And uh, that's truly, I think, you know, what, what, keeps admissions, you know, staff in the position is our love and passion for working with students. And so um, asking questions about our campuses and who we are and your major and what you want to do, like that's ah, it's the best. So talk to us, I think is the, the best thing you can do. Well, one little secret, I know for UCs, it may apply to your schools as well too. Um, I, it sounds right, but 
every, the school rep, so I know Kristen says she's a traveling, so that means admissions counselors travel to schools, right? They do presentations. They're also in some capacity involved in the admissions in that field as well, too. Like I know in Berkeley, right? My, my, one of my, my best, my best friend, she's the, the Orange County representative. So she comes here all the time and she's like the go-to Orange County person as well, too. So the person that visits your high school has somewhat of a say in the admissions uh, uh, as well, too, or at least she'll work with the team that will do doing admissions as well. So it's good to know them and say hi, for sure. Awesome. And we have one last official question on this, on this board. You, the, you, Palace, you guys are amazing. And you guys are cranking through all these questions as well. So we might not have any afterwards, but if you do, feel free to pop in the comments now. But our final official question here is, uh, how are admission rates calculated for a school? Are they different? How is and how is in-state and out-of-state different? All right, I hope you don't mind if I jump in again. One thing I wanna say is that um, many, many students apply to the same small number of colleges and universities. So there's some statistic like, 87% of students applying to colleges are applying to the same 15% of schools. So usually in those most selected schools um, where you know, they get 40, 100,000, uh, 80,000 applications, is admit rate really going to, to play into the, the situation? Um, it might also play into situations at universities where, you know, there's like the School of Engineering and they can only take so many students for that program. Um, but don't feel like every college or university pays great attention to their admit rate and that your chances of getting admitted are pretty slim. Um, and remember, the question was, how is GPA calculated, correct? Or was that the question? How is admission rates calculated and it, how is in-state admissions different than out-of-state admissions? Oh. Um, I'm sorry, same thing here. Um, we, um, about 60%, I'd say about 60% of our students are from outside of the state of Texas. Um, even though we're this small, mid-sized liberal arts school in central Texas. It's, uh, and we also have about a seven, eight percent international population. Um, but we don't have quotas. We don't look at students and give them a, a heads up because they're from outside of the state. Uh, I think uh, just over the years, uh, the brand has kind of grown and uh, it's kind of work that students coming from other states love to come to uh, a, a small mid-sized institution uh, in a major metroplex. Um, and so our out-of-state, our in-state, uh, they review the exact same way. Um, but as far as matriculation, it seems like we often have more students coming from outside of the state than inside of the state. I uh, echo what I, I'm seeing here in the chat from Kristen of we, we really are looking at who's going to be successful on campus. There's not a, um, you know, oh, but where are they from? Or, you know, that's, that's not on the table in terms of decisions. And um, I think admit rates are kind of up there with ranking, something that uh, we know students pay attention to, but in our world of work in terms of admissions and evaluation, it's not something we're paying attention to. We're paying attention to the individual um, who's applying and interested in our school. So um, I know at the U of A, again, we're, we're a large school uh, that has a, a really access focused mission. So we're at about 85% in terms of our admit rate. Um, and uh, again, though, like Kristen was sharing, that's, that's that number, what does that really mean, right? Because we're gonna see way more students applying to Harvard than to a U of A. And so that's already gonna skew the numbers. Uh, so you've gotta keep that in mind, that bigger context um, and, and just keep that in mind. Ditto. <laughs> I stole it, Rod. <laughs> awesome. Well, we have a few questions that kind of popped in right here as well. Too. I think you mentioned Harvard. Uh, so I think as admissions officer, I think I'm sure you guys can understand how different schools kind of work, kind of given your school. So a question a student asked is, 
what separates an Ivy League applicant from a state university applicant? So I want to try to rephrase it to make it a little more broad of like, what how, what do certain schools look for? Like, how, how would it differ from the different types of universities out there? I can speak from a, a large land grant research uh, institution. Uh, and I think it's it really does come down to your personality a little bit. And so a school like the University of Arizona, um, you're going to have 40,000 other students on your campus. Um, you're going to have a student from every single state uh, across the country. You're gonna have students from all over the world. Um, it's It's got lots of majors and disciplines. And so that's something too, uh, to, to make sure your program is offered where you are looking. Uh, so we have you know 300 different degrees and that kind of thing. So there's just, a lot of opportunity at the scale of a large campus, um, even just physically, you know, we're one square mile here in Tucson. So uh, the scope and size kind of matches that that size of our campus a little bit. Um, and so for students, you know, who who are looking for that type of environment, they they want a big school, they want a school that has those sports teams, or they want a school um, that kind of has that history in, in their state or region. That's something that I think um, sets a big school like the U of A or a public state school apart a little bit. Um, I can't speak for the Ivies because I, I don't represent them, but I can share that of you know what, what I hear from students in terms of why they look to a school like the U of A or other state land grant schools. Awesome, cool, cool. Uh, we have another awesome question from Delaney. Uh, how do you guys keep it, like, how do you guys consider the interesting year of 2020 in, grade, in, in terms of the grades? Let's say their grades during the, when they were like virtual learning was a little lower than um, their normal trip over grades. How do you guys, how do you guys view that? And what's any recommendation for students or words of wisdom for them? We are pretty, um, yes, it comes down to your grades, but we can be forgiving. Usually I tell students to use their personal statement to their advantage. If there's a reason your grades were low, it, whether it's a pandemic or you got in an accident and you couldn't write because your hand was broken or whatever it is, there's a lot of times that like someone's grades one year just, just don't match their profile. Um, that's what to use that personal statement for. Definitely let us know what happened, under, let us understand it. So I don't think that students should worry. I think you're in the same boat as a lot of students with um, virtual learning being a learning curve. So I think um, don't don't fear for that. Just make sure to explain it. Use those personal statements to your advantage just to be able to say, hey, you know what? I had a really bad internet and I had to miss four of my classes a week and whatever happened, let us know that so that we can understand why one year had dipped, whether it was your ninth, 10th, 11th senior year. Um, we, we can definitely work with you. And don't forget that your counselor uh, maybe your teachers are also explaining what the situation was like at your school. Um, so, you know, we'll get a sense through them uh, if classes were pass fail or everybody was learning virtually or, um, you know, students had poor access to internet and things like that. Um, so you won't have to explain it all. You'll have other people helping uh, give us a sense of the scenario. Awesome. Uh, if you guys can chat about that, I want to reword it a little bit. Aro asked a question of like, is it possible to meet the requirements for graduate school, such as medical school, if you majored in a certain major? What I'm understanding the question as is, um, can you fulfill like your pre-med, pre-law requirements um, and doing by doing a certain major? That's my understanding. Let me know if I'm right, Arwa. But anyone wants to take that? Yeah, I'll dive in. I think I would assume many of us have uh, pre-professional areas of study. So like maybe pre-health uh, as well as pre-law. 
Uh, and pre-health may include pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dental, advanced physical therapy, some students may have nursing. Um, so these programs are typically um, great in preparing students for that next step and pairing and helping them to pair whatever the area they want to major in with still getting the preparation they'll need to prepare for med school or for law school or for whatever professional school they plan on going into. Uh, and at some of the schools, like at SMU, we even have a, a pre-health advisor uh, that's there to help students with uh, advising, to help them with internship opportunities, to help make sure they're taking the courses they'll need with whatever major they choose. Um, so that's typically an option, I would assume, at, at most of the institutions listed on this, this call. Awesome, fantastic, cool, cool. I'm gonna be selfish one last time today. I wanna, I wanna try to end up with a, a, a really awesome question to wrap it up. So you guys are four incredible, thank you again, by the way, for how, coming here, spending your time with us. Super amazing. I think everyone, I can hopefully speak to everyone. We had an amazing time learning from all four of you as well. So one last fun question i like to ask a lot of people, uh, what's one piece of advice you wanna give? Because all everyone in here are high school students, right? In different grades, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors as well too. What advice, it doesn't even have to be college related. What advice do you want to give like the high school youth of today? In any aspect that you want to use it for. I'm going to say like two things. Number one, enjoy your senior year. Um, a lot of schools look at your grades from ninth, 10th and 11th. So that does not mean that you should not do well because we still review those grades. But enjoy it, you know, spend time doing stuff that you're really passionate about, get to know who you want to be. Um, and that way, when you get to college, you can really find yourself. Uh, the other thing on the admission side is really please, please, please pay attention to deadlines. I have met too many students that because they missed a deadline, their admissions decision changed. If they had just got their application completed two days sooner, it would have been, you know, admitted, but instead they got, you know, denied. So definitely pay attention to deadlines and application lines and stuff, but definitely just enjoy your senior year. It, it's the time, time of your life. <laughs> do what you love. Don't do things because you think it'll look good on a college application or you're trying to build a resume or get into college by taking all these APs. Do it because you love it. Do it because you want to take that class or you want to be involved in volunteering in the community, or you just love music or painting. Um, we're not, most of us are not reading applications uh, with an eye to reject students. We're reading applications with an eye to find that match and to admit you. So it's not about checking off boxes and do you meet certain criteria and have all these qualities. Uh, we really want to know you based on what you love to do and, you know, that you're comfortable taking yourself out of your comfort zone because it's something that you enjoy doing, not that you think other people want you to do. And I think that's all great advice. I, if I could add just one little piece. Um, and this is kind of hard because oftentimes, um, college is an investment with both you and your parents, uh, and it is a, a joint process, but choose something that you love to do and not what you think is, what you think will be impressive to other people or what you think is gonna make you a ton of money. Uh, you wanna try to think about majoring in something that you actually like, <laughs> um, because ultimately this is something you'll end up probably doing for the rest of your life. So. Think about that and think about what works for you and what you want to do versus, well, I'm just gonna do this because, you know, I have to do it because this looks good if I major in this area. Oh, such good advice. <laughs> Loving it. I'm like, yes, to all of this. Um, I would say a similar theme of explore your passions and interests and that extends beyond the classroom. Um, and so college, wherever you go, is a really formative time in your life to, to figure out a lot of things um, and to explore who you are and what you are interested in and 
um, more about your identity and more about uh, the world, about research. Like there is so much that happens in that collegiate experience. And so I think really, you know, make the most of it wherever you go, uh, immerse yourself in the campus community, get involved, uh, take opportunities. If a professor says like, hey, I've got this internship, talk to them about it. Um, so I think that would be my advice is, you know, take opportunities, uh, even if they're around something that you're like, I have no idea what that is, but it sounds cool. Take, take people up on it. Um, that would be my advice. And then from an admission standpoint, I think, uh, you know, Katie talked about this earlier, but visit if you can. I think that's a huge part of the puzzle. And because of the pandemic, there's a lot of accessible content um, online now for you to visit, tour, watch videos, that kind of thing uh, for the different campuses. So connect with our teams as best as you can. All right. Thank you so much. One more time. I dropped all of our amazing palace emails in the chat. They are amazing. They said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to just email them as well. The more you guys see admissions offers are really, really awesome. So feel free to just reach out and ask if you have any questions at all. all right. And I'm going to throw it back to you, John, to wrap it up today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Tony. And thanks to our panelists, Emily, Katie, Rod, Kristen. Thanks so much. You guys did a great job. And it was really informative. Uh, I wish I had done this last year when my daughter was applying to college, but, uh, but thanks anyway. We're gonna have this posted also on our website. So anyone who missed or came late can also catch up and watch at your leisure. Uh, Coach Tony, I had mentioned it earlier. Um, if you weren't able to take notes, do watch it again and go through the video. Um, and there's a lot of great content and a lot of great comments by our panelists. Thanks so much.